Welcome everyone to the Biodiversity Information Standards Conference, TEDRIC 2020. This is the Symposium 4, Challenges of the Alignment of Collection Management Systems Across the Globe and Different Domains. I'm your moderator, Falko Löckler, from the Natural History Museum in Berlin, Germany. My co-moderators and helpers are Heimo Reiner, Mareike Petersen and Sabine von Mehring. And uh, we are grateful for the technical support from Holly Little and Brenda Deddy. This session will be recorded for later viewing. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, thanks to all the speakers already um, in our session, we will have six presentations um, of 10 minutes each and five minutes for questions and answers uh, directly after each talk. Uh, we would like to collect your questions, preferably in the Google document um, uh, that is linked here. If, thank you very much. And um, this document will also be used by the speakers uh, to answer your questions later. Um, if you use the chat for questions, uh, please highlight your uh, questions by prepending the term slash question to help the moderators uh, better find uh, the questions amongst other comments. Um, please use the chat uh, judiciously for topics relevant to the discussion. Otherwise, we might remove you from the virtual room and you uh, will not be able to re-enter. For more information, please see our code of conduct. Please keep your microphones muted. Um, if you want to ask a question orally, please raise your virtual hand by using the respective button um, in the Zoom menu or simply write slash hand in the chat to indicate that you want to speak. Last but not least, please bear with any technical difficulties we might, we might have. Um, I hope you enjoy the event in our symposium. And now I would like to give the floor to Winston Smith uh, with his uh, pre-recorded presentation towards community collections management. Hello, everybody. It's great to have this opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, I want to thank our organizers for putting on this symposium on aligning collection management systems, certainly a topic that's very close to my heart and uh, hopefully yours too. Uh, my name is Vince Smith. I'm part of a team working at the Natural History Museum in London on uh, something called RECODE, which stands for Rethinking Collections Data Ecosystems and essentially is our project to rethink our collections management system. And in particular, I want to talk to you a little bit about this topic of community collections management and use this uh, talk to unpack a little bit about what, uh, uh, what I think um, community collections management really means. So I think it's fair to say that um, the purpose of a collection management system is often very different for many different institutions. And that role of collection management systems has evolved very considerably uh, over the years. Indeed, TADWIG was arguably founded on that problem of managing collections information. And at that time, back in, I guess it was the uh, late 80s, um, the basic problem was how do you go from a set of analog card indexes containing bits of information to some form of digital collections, digital collection catalog. And then, of course, that role has changed over the years. We started to build databases, uh, management interfaces for things like loans, collection management systems can support things like um, enforcing policy and standards. We began to publish that data, exchange that data, and uh, a whole ecosystem of richer, fairer linked data is now available through the web. 
uh, creating basically whole new paradigms of research um, based on collections. And in many cases, often our institutional identities and missions around what collections based institutions are is deeply vested in that digital um, uh, representation um, of the collection. But of course, there are many challenges to um, uh, this space in terms of managing and constructing collection management systems. The technology changes, the digital architecture changes quite considerably. There's a great deal of complexity that again is ever changing in terms of the content of the data we need to manage. There's all sorts of issues surrounding the curation of that data and how we share the task of managing the contents of those systems. Um, often the business models for those systems are on pretty shaky ground. We traditionally have not invested enough in this topic. And as a consequence, um, I think many of our systems that we use um, you know, are, are, are struggling because of that. And it's probably only recently that many institutions have really started to take seriously the issue of how we govern those systems um, uh, with, within uh, our institutions. And these are tricky topics, even for the really big institutions like mine to handle, um, let alone um, many of the smaller ones. Now, I'm pleased to say that in recent years, a fantastic set of really amazing initiatives has sprung up building collection management systems and trying to share the task of constructing these systems. And these are great in that they've built whole communities focused on really that, that, that challenge of addressing some of those issues I listed earlier. And of course, as the saying goes, a problem shared is a problem halved. And I think that's very true in the context of collection management systems. But there is a kind of a big but here. And that is simply that often because many institutions have quite different visions about what their needs are with respect to collections management, often balancing those very different needs out and finding that common point of intersection, which, and I speak personally in an NHM context in London, even that common vision for the system within our own institution is hard enough to find, let alone when you um, magnify that across many different institutions. And one of the things that we've, I think, really struggled to do is in particular, we struggle to distribute that task of how we think about managing the content of those uh, collection management systems. We've become quite good at managing the technology now, but not so good at managing that shared task of curating the content. And I just want to unpack a little bit about what, uh, what I mean by that. So the way that we manage our uh, collections data right now is frankly very siloed. An institution, a curator, maybe a researcher within an institution will create a record. That record will then get published in some form. And then a whole suite of different users will edit, annotate, link, um, uh, correct, uh, 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 and make all sorts of changes to that record for their own particular purpose. And none of those enrichments and edits and changes make their way back to the institution. And what's worse, of course, this is happening across not just one institution, but all the different publishers of collections data. So what we need to move toward, and of course, this is something that I think many of us have talked about for a, a while, these slides or these images from these slides are borrowed from something Donald Holborn talked about back in 2013. We need to move towards a shared knowledge base where the concepts around these data are essentially being commonly shared and curated and managed in a more centralized way. And whilst this might not be suited to all elements of a collection management system, there are certainly many concepts within our systems that can be shared and managed in this way. So I think particularly of taxonomy and nomenclature uh, issues around people, uh, people, so authorities, collectors, geospatial information, stratigraphic concepts, for example, all of those are fairly unequivocally and uh, easily shared and could be curated in a more um, shared way. And that simply isn't the possible at the moment with many of our systems. However, there are a few signs of systems that are coming online on the web, um, not collection management systems per se, but certainly systems where this task of sharing the curation 
of data is becoming a reality. And I've listed a few examples here. So things like Wikidata, iNaturalist, um, for example, Bionomia, and also to some degree being enabled by things like ORCID, the um, identifier system for people, which is a mechanism by which we can to some degree personalize and bring a lot of these data together under the identities of the individuals creating it. And there's another really interesting element to these systems and that they have made that task of curation fun. And I realize not everyone would necessarily regard these things as fun, but for often for nerds like myself and, and, and many within um, collections-based institutions, that task of curating data in a shared way is actually really great fun um, and allows us to achieve uh, and address all sorts of um, goals in common with others through that sharing act of curation. Now, this is something that, as I say, has not really been possible in collection management systems yet, but is beginning to become possible. And in particular, this task of making it fun, I think is really central to actually making that process of engaging with these systems, or well, frankly, much more engaging. So what's needed to construct all of this? Um, no real surprises here. These are things, topics that we talk about often endlessly, things like data standards, persistent storage. We already have a pretty good culture of reuse of data, shared information models, and of course, much more collaboration, particularly with um, uh, our infrastructures. Many examples are listed on the sides of this slide here. And of course, much more institutional collaboration to make that task of shared curation possible. But the other big advance that I think has happened in recent years is that platforms um, are beginning to enable um, the shared task of uh, curation. It starts to become possible with the underlying platforms that we use. And I want to call out one that Natural History Museum London have been looking at in particular here, this concept of content service platforms which are highly configurable, often based on a whole set of microservices. So they're very much focused around a very well documented API. And they have basically all the underlying infrastructure to enable the construction of um, a collection management system that is standards compliant, etc. They have a lot of that built into them already in a way that leaves the institution, the collections based institution to do the, the really kind of build on its area of expertise, which is, of course, implementing a collection management system for its own needs. And this is something that we've been looking at in the context of this Recode project. This is essentially a, a, a four year project um, split into three different phases. First phase is really about uh, getting that full specification for our systems. The next phase is design and implementation. And the third phase is um, hyper care and kind of continuous improvement. I just want to unpack that first phase just in a little bit more detail. So right at the moment, we're busy building up that set of requirements for our system, looking at data models, migration plans, also our wider portfolio of systems that we want to think about how we integrate our digital asset management system, our data portals, our digitization processes, et cetera. And there's a very particular reason why we need to think about doing this sooner rather than later, because NHM London was recently awarded 180 million to build a new site as part of the Harwell campus in Didcot in Oxfordshire, uh, we'll be moving about 40% of our collection from uh, 2026. So as you can imagine, a huge planning ex uh, exercise is underway right now. And this is a real opportunity to rethink the concept of a natural science collection and rethink all of our processes to create, I guess what I would call a digital first museum. And, uh, uh, and truly embed this into our collections management system. So as I say, a great deal of thought is going on right now in terms of internally about uh, pulling those um, stakeholder requirements together. Of course, very mindful of the limits of gathering um, stakeholder requirements. When you talk to people about what they need, they're often very constrained by the scope, their understanding and their concept of uh, uh, change 
um, within the context of their needs. So there are often limits to what those stakeholder engagement and requirements gathering exercises can do. But that programme of stakeholder requirements is not just limited to NHM London. We want to work with other peer institutions, other technology providers, certainly the wider um, research community, and also all these amazing um, global and European initiatives that NHM London is involved in. And so finally, I just want to end with really a little bit of an advert about a workshop we're planning in late December, or early December actually, um, and we very much invite you to come along to that. And if you're interested, please contact our program manager, Steen DuPont, email address is listed there, who um, can help you with more information than that. So thank you for your time. And um, I, if there is time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, Vince, for this really interesting and inspiring um, pre-recorded uh, presentation. So you're perfectly in time. What a surprise. So we have uh, the opportunity to answer some questions. Um, so just as a reminder, if you have questions, we would prefer if you put them into the Google document, um, but you can also uh, write your questions into the chat um, and prepending slash question to it. So um, amongst all those nice comments in the chat, uh, um, my co-moderators will be able to find them. And you can also raise your hand and uh, uh, speak and raise your question orally. Um, is there any question from the audience right now? It's also a question to my co-moderators. I, I see there's not a comment yet, um, but a number of people picked up on this point about um, making collection management systems fun. Um, and there were quite a few comments on that. So maybe just a quick remark on that. I, um, I was speaking to my program manager about this, who looked at me in a sconce as if to say I was kind of crazy when I talked about the need to make it fun. But certainly my engagement with platforms like iNaturalist and um, some other platforms, it's almost addictive. And the way that we do peer review and the way that we can actually kind of create common goals within those platforms, I think community curation creates that possibility of really uh, personalizing engagement in a way that we don't traditionally think about. And I know we're just on the cusp of this, we're not really quite there yet, but I think it's something we need to think about a lot more in terms of the social incentives around why people engage and, and, and how we do that. So just a quick remark on that point. Thanks, Vince. And I just saw a question raised by uh, uh, by Debbie Paul. Um, when is it ready? That's that's always the killer question. So the specification um, is planned to be ready for September next year. And I did put in the comments. That's a public document. And so, for example, if you want to. If you want to go off and build your own collection management system, I think the data that we collect as part of this work, making that a public document is going to be hopefully really helpful to many others, or at least we'll, we'll do some of the, um, uh, the headline work. There's then basically a kind of a one and a half to two year build process um, that then sits on top of that. So uh, we're still a way out. These things are always very complex, but that spec will be due September next year. Sounds good. Thanks. And we have a raised hand by Dimitri Shigo. Please unmute yourself and go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, th thanks, Vince. Um, with all my doubts about digital first and um, all things around that, I, I think that part about fun is, is uh, very true. And I think many of us uh, actually started databasing and are involved in the activities like, like designing systems. Um, for the fun of it, for the coziness of it. There are different kinds of positive vibrations, not just fun. I mean, it, it is like a well-functioning database brings such unbelievable satisfaction 
that you that you can only get from a good uh, crime series or something like that. And I think many of us feel these emotions, but it's very rarely that we discuss those personal feelings in the meetings like Tadwick. So you did very good job uh, surfacing this. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just very briefly, the digital first piece, just to pick up on that. Um, our new facility at Harwell has really created a real buzz of excitement around what, what it means to rethink many of our processes and uh, in, in terms of digitization, collection management, et cetera. And so I think there is, um, there, there's a lot of kind of, it's the cultural piece around digital that I think is really um, exciting and, and trying to integrate that into a CMS. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. I see a question um, raised by uh, Andy Bentley. Uh, why design a new CMS uh, rather than work with existing systems to improve, expand, integrate? So a, a brilliant question, a tough question as well. And I think one that we wrestle with. So um, for about oh, five, six years now, um, we've been running various projects, programs, assessing the existing collection management systems, trying to map them to our needs, trying to um, uh, get a kind of a more community position working with some of our local large natural science collections. And the bottom line is that none of them sufficiently fit our needs, coupled with the fact that the a concept of using these um, sort of enterprise content management systems, as they're, they're described, creates a real opportunity to have a, a very sustainable technology provider, but allows us to be in the driving seat of implementing the standards, the specifications, the business logic, etc. And in the end, when you reconcile all of these, uh, we ended up coming back to that need to not go it alone, but but that none of the others out there quite fulfilled our needs. Um, there, there's a lot more to unpack and we're out of time, I'm sure, um, it, with that answer. But maybe I'll try and expand a bit more in the context of the Google Doc. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vince. We actually need to move on. And there is also uh, one more question and even more questions are coming up. So. Uh, I would really like to encourage uh, some of you um, to also bring up the questions, maybe uh, when it fits to other talks. I see that in, in the question raised by uh, Sharif. And of course, uh, all our speakers um, are encouraged also to answer the questions in, in the document in parallel or even after the session. Our next speaker is uh, Miko Heikinen. Um, and he also pre-recorded um, his presentation on um, multi-domain collection management simplified the Finnish national collection management system, Kotka. So let me just share my screen. We go. Okay. Uh, I am Mikko Heikkinen from the Finnish Museum of Natural History, Luomus. I'm a biologist working as an IT specialist, and I've been involved in building the Finnish collection management system called Kotka. This is what I'm now going to tell you about how it was created and how it was extended for all Finnish natural history museums and what we have learned along the way. First, to give you some background, uh, about 10 years ago, Lomos had the same problem that many museums have. We had multiple different collection management systems and many of them were outdated. 
it was uh, difficult to manage them all and difficult to use and share the data. So we started to think what to do. Uh, we evaluated different options and in the end decided to build a new system from scratch. But we wanted to do it in a bit different way than these kind of systems are usually made. I'll tell you in a moment what I mean by this. Uh, so we have been building Kotka since 2012. Programming is done by in-house developers. We had some prior experience uh, on making a collection management system, so we were confident that we could build a new system by ourselves. When we started, we first focused on one collection only and built tools, tools for that, and then expanded into a second collection, third collection, and so forth. Uh, so we have been going forward in an agile way, step by step. So now, uh, eight years later, we have about two and a half million specimens from 12 institutions in the system. So it's used practically by all Finnish natural history museums. The data is published in the Finnish National Biodiversity Portal, species.fi, along with uh, 35 million uh, other records. Uh, Kotka is multi-domain. Uh, it covers geological, botanical, and paleontological collections, as well as uh, DNA samples, and also uh, microbial collections and botanic garden living collections. So what we have done differently? Uh, our focus and priority has been always on creating practical tools for collection managers and on making uh, digitization processes efficient. Uh, also, flexibility and simplicity of the system have been important since we haven't had a lot of resources uh, for developing it. An idea that I partic particularly like uh, comes from the Pareto principle. Uh, it means that often 80% of the results can be achieved by 20% of the effort. So if we focus on the most important things, we can achieve much of what we need by a fraction of the resources. Uh, then things that we have consciously chosen not to focus on are uh, creating a comprehensive data model, uh, following conventional rules of database development, unless uh, really necessary, or having uh, com committees or groups of people steering the development. We've always had one person in charge making development decisions, but still talking with and listening uh, and trying to understand all kinds of users and all the museums that use the system. Uh, what this means from a technical point of view then. Uh, first, our data model is not based on a conventional relational database. Uh, we have not tried uh, to create a way to model relationships of, of all possible aspects of specimens. Um, instead, we are using a, a non-relational database, which is very simple and contains mostly denormalized data. Uh, we have a simple hierarchical data model, which allows, for example, data entry as a flat Excel table. Uh, we don't have strict rules and strict validation of the data. Um, data harmonization, cleaning and improvement uh, can be done over time or automatically when sharing the data, at least partially. So improving data quality is something that can be done over time. Uh, the system is also easy to extend by adding new fields whenever needed, uh, and they are needed quite often. We currently have about 200 different data fields for specimens, but only five of them are mandatory. Uh, to give an example of uh, what this denormalization means, here are two simplified specimens. Both are from Finland, even though they use a different country name or code. Both have the same taxon concept, but use a different name for that also. And then the collector name is spelled out as it is known. Uh, so we don't have to harmonize names if we don't want to or we cannot do it for some reason. And all of this leads to a faster development and faster data entry. But <clears throat> even if technology would be simple, uh, real world is not. Even though collection management is a thing that's shared by all museums, practices can be uh, very different. 
There are differences in traditional practices. There are different research objectives. For example, what kind of data is collected? Um, and there can be strong opinions. Uh, there can be differences between institutions, differences between departments within the institutions, and even people working in the same collections. Uh, I have here two real world examples of uh, what we have faced, faced actually within the last uh, few months. Uh, so the first example, how to record associated taxa. So uh, when a plant specimen is collected, we often record uh, the different species that are growing together with that specimen. How to enter those associated taxa into the database? Uh, option one, this is how it's done on Kotka, and this is how it's done uh, in the museum in Helsinki since uh, 1980s. Uh, here, all associated taxa are independent observations that are part of the specimen. Uh, since they are independent specimens, we can also add information like abundance to each of them. And all of them are also um, occurrence records that can be shared and used. Uh, however, a uh, second museum that also uses Kotka does not want to do it like this. Instead, they want to write down this information as part of the habitat description. So the habitat description uh, and the list of species uh, are written in one single field. Uh, so what to do in this kind of case? Well, Kotka allows both ways. Both can, can, can continue working as they have. Uh, having data in two different formats will make using it more difficult and sharing it more difficult, but at least we have the data stored. Another example, where the master version of specimen data is stored. And uh, by master version, I mean the version which uh, is kept up to date, where all changes should be done, like correcting errors or adding new information. And in the case, uh, the data between copies is inconsistent, which version should be use, used and trusted. Um, so is the master version of the data uh, on the labels of the physical specimen? printed or written on the, to the paper labels? Or is the master data in the database? Uh, I think this has big implications on how, to, how, on how the system should work, what kind of features are needed, what kind of workflows need to be supported. If we need to support both cases, it takes much more work. Can we do that work? Uh, so my question is, when building a system for multiple users, how much flexibility there should be, what kind of flexibility there cannot be, and what kind of principles must be fixed and agreed by all users. And especially if we are dealing with uh, several independent organizations, what can be agreed on? Often organizations and institu institutions have independently created policies and practices which must be followed. Well, anyway, in all cases, uh, finding the differences and harmonizing existing practices, uh, it's a slow and complicated process. We have been working with Kotka for almost a decade, and we are still finding our way through these issues. So, um, as a final note, um, if you are making a system for multiple organizations, Keep the technical sides as simple and flexible as possible, because there are always enough non-technical challenges uh, that are waiting to be solved. Uh, thank you for listening and feel free to contact us if you'd like to know more. Thank you, Miko, for this really nice uh, um, pre-recorded presentation. And uh, we have time for your questions. And I would like to um, ask my co-moderators. Um, there's really lots of things going on in the, in the chat. So I'll try to, to find a, a question that is really um, obvious to me in the chat. But feel free, all the other co-moderators, to help out. So. The question I see here is by uh, Christian Köhler. 
um, and he asks, by creating your own data schema, uh, aren't you in the da in danger of creating a remote data island, um, not compatible with common data aggregators? Um, yeah, uh, Kotka's data model was originally based on ABCD. Uh, so the basis is the same. Uh, we've been evolving it on our own. And we actually have a, a full schema for the whole Finnish biodiversity information facility. So shared schema for um, um, museum specimens, observations, all the data that we are managing at FinBiv. Um, so it's quite complex. Uh, we are keeping eye on standards. Uh, we have tested on um, uh, converting the data to Darwin Core, for example. So uh, that should go fine. And we are um, always, like I said, uh, keeping eye on um, how things are done internationally. So if we need to do something new, manage some kind of new data, uh, we'd like to learn from uh, the international standards and experiences. So it shouldn't be a data island. OK, thanks. Um... I see a question in the Google document by Vauta, which is a really big question um, um, and could be actually addressed to, to all our speakers today. Um, so basically, um, he summarizes that uh, uh, the DISCO institutions, so um, the members of the DISCO um, initiative, uh, has spent uh, 8 million euros per year on development uh, of their more than 100 collection management systems. What if we spend that money only on two or three of the systems? So, yeah, uh, a difficult question. That's, that's actually a big one and not only specific to you, Miko. So. I'm not sure how to make that happen. So um, how to make a system or few systems, which might be actually better um, uh, instead of one system for all, how to make them flexible enough and uh, how to adapt them quickly enough for local needs. Yeah, and actually this is also one of the um, uh, reasons why we put together this symposium and um, hopefully we can we can take all these questions and continue the discussion, especially when it comes to those big, uh, big uh, um, questions, um, even after the conference. And there are several opportunities also to do that even during the conference. So I would um, allow one more question that is raised by uh, Falco Flesner. Um, he asks, has there been any feedback from the scientists on your fast approach? Uh, is it useful for their purposes? Um, I don't have the recent uh, information on the recent development on that, but it's uh, it's been a tricky to adapt if you mean by scientists like uh, people who are not gathering only the commonly used data about specimens, but for example, a complex relationships between fungi growing in the same tree and so forth. Uh, so we have been adapting some of them, uh, not all of them. Some uh, researchers are uh, using their own system on database for managing the, their data and then exporting from that to Kotka. Uh, if their data is about uh, museum specimens, which, which are accessioned by the museum. So some of them, uh, not all of them, we have a flexible way of uh, storing like measurement data. So if someone wants to uh, measure some kind of new thing about a specimen, whether it's, be, it's, a, it's a size or almost anything, uh, we can adapt that. But uh, the co more complex the data is, uh, the more complex and difficult it becomes. Okay, thank you very much, Miko. There is still one question left, uh, at least in the Google document on the searchability. So I would like to ask you to uh, try to answer that question in the document. 
Um, yeah, uh, please add questions. I'll look them later after the session, at least. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mikko. So then I would like to hand over uh, to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Edward Gilbert, and uh, he will present uh, the historical overview of the development of the Symbiota specimen management software and review of the interoperability challenges and opportunities uh, informing future development. The floor is yours. Okay, hey, uh, thank you. And um, I commend all the previous speakers for recording their their record, um, their presentation. Unfortunately, I'm not that well organized. So I'm gonna give a live presentation and I'm gonna give an overview of, of the development of Symbiota and, uh, and a review of some of the challenges and ideas for future development. And recording. All right, and there's a little delay in the recording, unfortunately. Um, okay, so the uh, Symbiota is an open source software project, a PHP application. It's available on GitHub. And within itself, there's no data associated with Symbiota at all. But what happens is, is uh, someone will, an entity, research entity will download the data, install a portal, and then they'll load the data. And the data generally has a certain taxonomic or geographic scope to it. And it establishes a theme for the portal. And it becomes a, a community-based portal. There's a set of configuration files and CSS files that can be adjusted. And these, um, these give it a particular look and feel that represent that research community. Uh, there is about 50 or 60 different uh, symbiotic portals out there that are public. And about 30 of them are being managed down at ASU. Um, and here's some examples of some of the portals. So there is this North American lichens. Uh, this is bryophytes of North America. This is a taxon-based portal, so it's New World Mertaceae. Uh, insects of mostly North America, but beyond. This is a mycological portal. And here's a portal of all taxa across all kingdoms from Panama, the country of Panama. And it's a collaborative portal between Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and ASU. So you can see they all have these different looks and feels, but the, the tools in the back end and that are available all work in a similar way. So overlap, where does, uh, where does Symbiota sit within the ecology of, of biodiversity information systems that are out there? And uh, I would argue that uh, the main points of Symbiota is it's specimen-based and um, and it's a service-based, it's a community um, architecture that allows people to create these research-based portals that provide these services. And it will be a little clearer further along in the presentation. And it's a content management system. So as compared to, um, to the other systems out there as the EOL, iNaturalist, even GBIF and IDIC file, there's overlap in its functionality. And part of the functionality of Symbiota is collection management. And um, when we first started to design Symbiota, we did not design it as a connection management system, content management system. Uh, we designed it as a uh, search interface that integrated multiple collections and allowed a user to explore all those collections as a single unit. And we first started design this as roots back 20 years ago. And uh, as, as we did that, we realized that some of these collections that were integrated in as a snapshot, uh, they were struggling, the institutions were struggling to make their data available in a reliable manner. So we realized that these collections would benefit if they can manage data directly within the portal and that could be their management tool. So we started to add in these data management tools that kind of snowballed from there uh, to become a full content management system where most of the data in there can be managed through the browser. So here's an example of a Symbiota portal instance. 
Um, the data on the left there, the, uh, the green data symbols, that represents taxon-based information. So there might be morphological data in there that powers the identification keys, could be field images, uh, species checklist, inventory information, taxon um, uh, descriptions. But the core data in most portals is the occurrence data, and in particular, specimen data. And there's two classes of occurrence data that exist here. Um, the top part is a, what we consider data snapshot data. And that's data that's imported in from uh, external systems. So institutions that are managing data within their own in-house in um, management tools, such as Specify, EMU, Brahms, or Arctos. Um, the data could also be imported from any IPT. And those data snapshots have to be refreshed on a regular basis. Then there's a second set of data, and that's data that's managed as live data sets directly in the portal. So anytime someone makes a change, it's immediately recognized within the portal, doesn't have to be uh, refreshed. And currently, you know, across all the Symbiota portal, there's probably about 50 or 60 million um, occurrences that are within the portals. Um, I don't know, there's, it's hard to say, but maybe half of those are being managed live. There's over 400 collections that are using a Symbiota portal somewhere as their management tool. And in particular, if someone's using Excel or Access, we encourage them to move out of those systems and desktop type systems to manage it in the portal. So give you a little uh, uh, graphical representation of how Symbiota environment works. So here we have, we have these uh, three different portal instances. This is this dry, the Panama portal here. This is a New England portal in, in the US. So it's a consortium of Northeast herbaria. And here's a um, sign net, which represent vascular plants of North America. And these little dots represent collections are being managed live within the portals. They're live managed collections. However, they also have snapshot data within the portal. And, um, and some portals might have uh, reside, they might have only snapshots and that's it. So then, and that's the case mostly for the um, COTRAM, which is that Mertesia, American Mertesia portal. And within these, uh, so one of the criticisms and a valid criticism of Symbiota is, is now we have this system that's creating these isolated decentralized mini aggregators of data. And if I was a researcher and I was interested in a certain genus and I needed to compile that information, I'd have to go to each of those different islands. So that, that's, you know, that's a problematic aspect to this model. Um, now, each portal has a Darwin Core Archive publishing tool that's built into it and functions similar to an IPT. And that's used generally to push snapshot records uh, for instance, this sign net, and one of this portal here might be um, ASU vascular plants. And they might want to push their, um, their Mertesiae specimens out to Cotra. And they could use this Darwin Core Archive publishing tool to push that snapshot out there and use it to regularly refresh that snapshot. And then they might also be interested in pushing their, their specimens out to their Panama specimens to the Stry portal. And now you have a situation where there might be a Panama Mertesiae specimen that's represented in SIGNET as a live record, but it's represented as a snapshot within Cotram and Stry. So now you have these islands, but it's all not unique records either. There's overlap. So that adds to the, to the chaos. So, and this same, however, this, uh, Darwin Core Archive Publishing Tool is also used to push the data out to Cotram. And we're trying to help and aid these small, medium sized collections, in particular, managing data within the portal to push out to GBIF and make it the data available to, um, to the greater. So, what we want to do is some of the changes that we're looking towards and working towards is to expand the API infrastructure that's currently built in Symbiota and allow it to do record-to-record -record annotation, the record-to-record -record flow between the, the data portals. So in particular, let's say this ASU is managing their, that Mertesiae record 
from Panama within the live collection here. Anytime that edit is made, an annotation is made, we want it to be able to flow immediately up to the snapshots that are distributed with the different portals. So in that way, those snapshots become synchronized representations of the live data. And likewise, you know, within the COTRAM there or, or the snapshot within the Panama portal, the, um, the data editing tools are available to these snapshot records. However, the problem is if someone edits that snapshot record, the next time they refresh that snapshot, their edits are going to, get, going to be copied over. However, within the system, we do have it where that edit, that annotation is versioned within some versioning tables. So it doesn't disappear when that snapshot is, is copied over. So we want to create a control panel within the live collections where the collection manager could come and say, OK, within all the distributed sh snapshots, where have my records been edited? And then they could pick and choose and filter which data they want to annotations they want to pull back into the live collection. Two minutes. So in this sense, we have a situation where there's record record synchronization that's going on there. And, um, and if we do this across all the portal network, the whole portal community can become a data commons or a community of them. So now you no longer have these isolated islands of data. And, um, and then this infrastructure, you know, could also be um, they can make use of this infra infrastructure where data can flow between the um, collection management system, such as specify in the same manner and also between the global aggregators such as GBIP and IDIC bio. And uh, so why is Symbiota re relevant? Why has it been catching on? Um, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that some of the digitization data entry interfaces are unique and easy to use, but there's also, it's easy to import and export data, um, which is strongly compliant to, to Darwin Core. And, um, but my, I argue that the biggest reason why it's important is because uh, it, it's a platform, the architecture that allows you to create these aggregated mini data sets that are research-based. They represent this community of researchers and these domain experts. And it becomes a resource where uh, it becomes a biodiversity knowledge commons that's driven by these experts, so user-driven content management system. So to, um, to quote an uh, article that came out about a year and a half ago connecting data expertise, they say significant challenges include the um, absence of functional mechanisms for knowledge experts to curate and improve data. And this is where I think it's been um, providing services to the community where it connects the, the experts with the collection management system. And um, at that point, I think I'm probably running out of time, right? Maybe yeah. just- One more minute. Okay, one more minute. So uh, there's an example, there was about two months ago, there was a bunch of researchers down in Guatemala um, the collections, they were collection managers and they were pushing their data up to these different symbiota portals. So fish over the vertebrate portal, the mollusks up the invertebrate portal. And then they wanted to put the plants on Cynet, but plants, Cynet, that's North American plants, it was out of scope. I contacted them, I asked them if they wanted, you know, would make use of a, a Guatemala portal. So it spent a little bit of time for us. We established this portal. Within a couple of weeks, they had all the collections up there. They were mapping Guatemala specimens from New York Botanical Garden and creating this countrywide resource. Uh, I, I made it so it was a GBIF installation. And within a few days, they had 10 data sets that were published in GBIF. It's not a huge data set, less than 10,000 data, but it's a start, it's growing, and they're empowered to, to get this data up here. And I think that's where, um, that's where there's value within somebody. And that's where I said. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, great talk, really rich. And we also have some questions for you already in the Google document. So uh, Ben Norton asks, does the Darwin Core publishing tool validate the archive when created before it's sent? Why not leverage IPT? 
is it validate the archive and aspect of being a valid Darwin Core archive document or the data quality within it? <laughs> so um, it is a it is a valid Darwin Core archive and aspect. It um, can be imported by GBIF and and IDIC Bio. Um, the data quality in itself, it's it doesn't filter out the data. The only data that's filtered out is rare or sensitive data. Um, as controlled by the collection manager. Um, but uh, there are a lot of data quality tools built in and hopefully, and there's pressure from the community for the collection manager to, to improve their data set and to validate their data set. And, and that's, that is happening. So, but of course, um, it's always an effort. Thanks. The next question is by uh, Guido Sauter. Are there any intentions towards exploring existing data replication mechanisms and protocols? Exploring other data such. Um... Guido, maybe could you unmute yourself and maybe elaborate on this question? Uh, yes. Um... Thanks for this very interesting talk, Ed, um, this way while I'm having the opportunity. Um, I was thinking when you were explaining like the snapshots and like the, all the snapshots and like conflicts arise, et cetera, and how they need resolving, uh, that there is like in the database community, there is um, protocols and approaches for replicating data and um, basically pro propagating edits um, in a pretty much automated kind of way to prevent conflicts um, rather than providing the means to resolve them. So um, are there any intentions to um, do something in that kind of direction? Yeah, we're, we're always open to new technology and um, along those lines. And we experiment with database replication features that are built into MySQL and, and other features. Um, and uh, uh, one issue is that we run into a lot with these different technologies is firewall issues where the servers are trying to talk to each other. So All right, yeah. Web, web services and an API system kind of um, circumvents those issues. And we already have some API calls where, where there's some interaction going with geolocate. And, um, and actually web services where the Darwin Core archives could flow back and forth between the portals in an automated process. And that's been working really well. And so that's an area we're thinking of moving forward. But um, yeah, I would love to find other technologies that make this stuff easier too. So. OK, thanks, Ed. Um, we have time for one quick question and a quick answer. It's another question by uh, Ben Norton. Does Symbiota automatically transform a Symbiota compliant data set to a Darwin Core compliant data set? It does. So the way you could export the data or transfer data, there's two different formats. There's raw Symbiota format, um, and then there's a, a database format. So that's both the data um, Darwin Core publishing tool you and that all data export tools do. You could pick between those different schemas. And also the web services that transfer data to it. So uh, you could choose which schema you want to use. It doesn't do ADB, AD, ABDC yet, but um, we would love to add that. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, we need to switch or uh, um, give the floor to the, our next speaker. And here's a uh, short announcement. We actually expected uh, 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 James Beach here, um, but unfortunately he couldn't make it um, to the whole Tedwig conference. So we are happy that Noreen Spears jumped in um, and um, will substitute him. Um, but because of this very spontaneous uh, um, uh, uh, replacement uh, that uh, Noreen did, we are going to uh, swap um, the presentations, if this is still um, true, Noreen. I can go now if that's preferred. Okay, <laughs> when, 
when you can go now, then we will stick with the agenda and um, sure. then the floor is yours. I will okay. share your presentation and just thank you very much. Let me know to proceed with the slides. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I am going to so uh, our internet company is outside and cut off my internet four minutes before the mic check for this um, session and uh, I apologize it's been a crazy morning. Um, I am going to turn off my video. I have a, a device in place. I have internet from my son so um, but I, I want to ensure that my voice comes through loud and clear. So um, I apologize for that, but I'm going to stop my video. Okay, and as Falco said, um, I apologize on behalf of Jim Beach, who uh, could not present today, but asked me to be here on his behalf. There are two other changes that you may note. Um, one is my title. Frankly, it's more fun than Jim's, uh, but it also reflects a difference in our talks. When I was preparing to present, I read the other abstracts and realized that what we had submitted was kind of slightly outside of what others were presenting. So today I'm going to speak less about how software in general meets the needs of biological collections community and more about how our consortium specifically makes those decisions. Next slide. The overview asked us to speak uh, to the way in which we meet these six challenges. Obviously, if I started speaking about the tools that we have, um, this would go well past the time that everyone wants to be here. Um, but let me just suffice to say that our philosophy is to empower the user. You know your data and you are the best person to make the decisions about standardizing your data within your collection and to make the decision about what data you wish to share. Uh, I think the real question though here is what are the structures that we have in place that allow us to identify research design and develop new capabilities uh, based on community-led standards and protocols. Hence, I worked in that playful title. So uh, next slide. We are a consortium of members and as such, it is our member community that serves these roles. We have not always been member-led, but our guiding mission has always been to support every collection without regard to their size or the breadth of their resources. And so that's how we kicked off our Specify 6 re rewrite project. We visited collections, we talked to collection managers, curators, IT support staff, and developers. We then went out and we created software that was flexible enough to support all disciplines. Yes, that means our schema is huge. But we are, are also customizable so that you can use what applies to you and your collection, and you will not be encumbered by what you are not using. Our software allows our members to capture what is unique about their collection. Um, partially, we do this by not strictly adhering to a schema that is built around Darwin Core, although we absolutely support Darwin Core. Um, and what we hear from our members is that um, many of their specimens were collected through specific research grants and the data that they collected is not yet in a Darwin Core standard, but they still want to capture it and they want to have it ready when those standards are in place. Our flexible schema also helps us in some ways to capture human knowledge. I have attended a couple of different um, sessions, uh, Tadrog sessions, and um, both of them talked about how they were surprised about how much just knowledge the 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 collection managers brought and wasn't captured, you know, in this machine in the in the data. And we believe that we have enough fields that we can at least in some way capture this by by allowing things like um, descriptions and field notebooks to be searchable within the database because it's entered into our schema. Um, OK, so looking ahead. Um, as you probably know, we applied for and were awarded subsequent NSF project grants. But really, after that initial rewrite, any reference to community support or community building in the grant was removed, the big red X. And um, looking back, unfortunately, we, 
we didn't really fully realize what that meant. Um, we kept mechanisms in place to stay in touch with the community. We had always had a dedicated help desk. We have Andy Bentley, who many of you probably know, who is very active in the community and a part-time staffer. Um, we take part, continue to take part in community organizations like Tadbog and Spinach. But what we missed was those deeper collaborative conversations with multiple users um, from very diverse backgrounds. So in 2017, we uh, were asked by NSF to become sustainably funded. And once again, we went out to our specified community and we listened. In a way, we went back to our roots. So in keeping with that mission, we created a member-led consortium. And we are now so community-driven that it is stated in our bylaws. Next slide, please. We currently have 82 members that represent approximately 220 individual collections. Next slide. Our um, governance. So um, what are these community structures? First, we have founding partners who have two seats on each of our board of members. And our founding partners pay more um, because they're interested both in sustaining the project, but also in gaining influence and authority over the software. Other rotating seats fill the other seats on the board of members, um, and the board is advised by both a technical and science committee that is filled by representatives of all our membership. Um, each one of these groups includes external members um, from the larger community. For instance, our um, board of members includes a representative from uh, GBIF and from Disco. Okay, um, let's see. So next slide, please. At the center is our staff. We keep the communication flowing and um, we help organize our meetings. Next slide, please. And we invite every member to take part in our input me mechanisms, which include our help desk, posted feedback sessions, webinars, and um, member meetings. And in the next slide, um, we take a look at what this is as a process. So as a practical example of, of how this all works, um, we heard from a member that DIA sessions were going to be uh, legally required within their museum. So the first thing we did was we reached out to other members who had already shown an interest in gaining this capability to ask them for more information. Then we invited all of our members to take part in a feedback session where we presented our problem statement and a use case and we asked questions and we listened. From that meeting, we created a list of requirements and example workflows. And um, at that point we realized we needed more information. So that's where that feedback loop comes in. Uh, we went back to our members. We listened again, um, went back to our documents, refined our design and created a prototype. Um, once that prototype is complete, we will offer a demo. And, um, and finally, we will release a new version of the software. So that is our community driven decision making. Um, at its best. We also take continue to, to take part in the global community. Um, we are an organizational member of GBIF and represent our members there. And of course, we, we continue with uh, Tadbog and Spinach and the other organizations that I mentioned. Okay, next slide, please. We, uh, we see standardization as kind of two-pronged. Um, there's standardizing at the collection level where we offer, offer tools for checking data quality, things like controlled vocabulary. We allow for visualization of the data. Uh, we export based on standards. We do data checks on both importing and exporting. This really helps with that kind of fitness for use. Um, it uh, also helps when you standardize at the local level or within a, a museum or institution, um, you know, you, you can share a lot more of the resources such as mapping files, reports, labels, but also um, kind of have that expertise in-house and uh, many, many institutions benefit from that. As, a, as far as the community-based standards, um, such as DarnCore, 
um, we, you know, we've been compliant with Darwin Core for for a very long time. Um, we and continue to keep up with those uh, standards. But um, what are some other standards? So let's just take a look at um, taxon. So they say that a standard is not a standard unless everyone is using it. So with taxon as an example, um, to take advantage of this standard within our software, really the community would first need to agree on a few things like which authority would you like to use? Who updates it? Who supports it? And then in the local database, how do we bring that updated information in? So we did a survey of our members over the summer and what our users want in the software spans the spectrum. Some would love for it to be automatic and just update their tree. They don't even really need to know when. Um, others are very happy to do all their own manual updates and they really want nothing to do with automation, but most of them fall somewhere in between. So then the question becomes, um, do you want to see all of those changes? Do you want to be able to accept the changes or deny the changes? And then do you want to never see those changes again? Or do you want to capture those somewhere so that you can go back and reference them? These are the decisions that we'll need to make you know, once there is a global or community standard. We also see a role for our consortium actually driving the standards. So as an example of this, um, we have members sending their specimens out for 3D imaging that, and they're hosted in Morphosource. So they have asked us how they should capture this information back in their database. So again, we reached out to our members to see how they were documenting it. And it turns out that there is no one way of documenting that. So we can support the three ways that our members are currently using, but you know that's kind of a waste of resources. We'd rather just really support one way of documenting it. And we would like the community to kind of to tell us what that standard is. So what we're hoping is that our members then will go to the the standards to Tadwag standards community and um, ask these questions so that we will actually be driving the need for those standards. Oh, minutes. next slide, please. Uh, collaborative development. This is one of my one of my favorite things to talk about. We are open source, and it has always been our hope that we would have outside contributors. Specify 6 was architected to be modular, which made the addition of plugins fairly accessible. And we have had um, people contribute to our plugins. We've also had outside projects contribute to Specify 7. Basically, we um, give them a branch of our data and then we merge it back in. In fact, right now we have a collaborative developer who has released an iPhone app that uses the Specify 7 APIs and he wants to add statistical information. And so he is actually helping us to extend our APIs. Um, the biggest lesson we've learned is communication. When we reached out to our users in 2017, what we discovered is the IT support teams um, at our member institutions had developed extensions in Specify. We were able to take one of those and create a plugin. Um, we're still kind of learning and wrapping our heads around how to best leverage the others. But at the very least, if we have this communication, it informs us and in our decision making, and we can also help them um, in their decision making. Also, we found out that one was developing an extension at the same time we were putting it into the core software. So it's very, very important to have that communication. Okay, next slide. And the next slide is uh, data sharing. So um, in the absence of two-way APIs, basically, we currently export data and we link to outside resources. Obviously, APIs are so important. And um, we need to reach out to, to the community and keep up with what is being resourced by other people, but also develop our own. And of course, in, um, we have data services. We need to keep, we are continually keeping up and ask our members to help us um, find these resources and continue to learn about where they are in their development and how we can best take advantage of them for our members. Okay, next slide. And that just brings up the interoperability challenge. I kind of hit on it a little bit with the taxon example. Um, we 
want vocabulary lists, so which includes that single authority, more global data standards. So schemas um, are, you know, very, very important that we need to keep up with those, of, of course, but the more that the community can can reach um, agreement on these standards, then of course that informs what what we put into our software. And then there's unique identifiers. So it'd be great to have, um, you know, we put in specify six unique identifier on basically every, each string of data. Um, it'd be great when, I, when the data goes out, sometimes um, these services add their own unique identifiers. So there needs to be a clearinghouse, um, but also when our members send their data out, um, don't strip them off <laughs> so that we can, actually get back to that data and see what the changes may have been. Okay, I'm thinking I'm probably out of time. I thought yes. I heard a two minute yes. warning. Okay, yes. sorry. All right. So what actually the presentation uh, was very nice. Thank you, Noreen, for jumping in um, for, for Jim and um, it was really great to, to have this uh, presentation here on Specify. I would allow um, one quick question with a quick answer. Um, and so the first question that came into the uh, Google document was asked by uh, Doug um, Anderson. Um, would you know if Specify and Dina are still connected, share source code developments, or maybe even connect the two front ends to the same back end database? Um, it, is that a question of whether we are connected or whether we plan to be? <laughs> the, there was a, a um, um, collaborative effort um, in the past. And so um, I would suggest that, uh, Doug, maybe we can uh, bring up your question, um, maybe even after the, the Dina presentation, which would be next. Um, That's probably so. more a question for, for you, Falco. <laughs> I, I think so. Um, but Noreen, there are still two uh, open uh, questions, and um, please feel free to answer them uh, uh, during the next presentation or after our session. Thank you very much again. Thank you. And um, as already mentioned, uh, we will now proceed to the next presentation, which is um, done by me. And I assumed that I would talk a lot as a moderator here, or at least a little bit more than others. So I also pre-recorded um, my presentation. Um, so enjoy. Hi hey everyone, my name is Falko Glöckler. I'm the head of the Department of Science Data Management at the Natural History Museum in Berlin, Germany. On behalf of my colleagues and co-authors, I would like to present the activities within the DINA Consortium on the development of open source software and services for natural history collections and related research. For those of you who do not know DINA, I'm going to summarize in a nutshell what DINA is. DINA is an international consortium for the development of digital information systems and services for natural history institutions with the vision to provide museum staff with efficient tools to support the handling and digitization of collections and to enable the research community to work with natural history collections in a more effective way. Our goal is to produce a standardized software environment for collection management that consists of modular web-based open source components and services that are developed and maintained in a community-driven approach by several large institutions with dedicated resources. The DINA Consortium comprises a group of core member institutions and several associate members. All members share the DINA vision and interests and contribute with their diverse expertise to the common activities of DINA. Representatives of the member institutions constitute the steering committee, which drives the strategic decisions of the group, for which the core members committed dedicated human resources for the development of common guidelines 
the DINA data model, and for the collaborative development of software code. The letter also includes the contribution of code that would be actively developed in the institutions anyways. If you would like to know more details about DINA, please visit our website dina-project.net. There you can find an open documentation about the consortium, links to the code repositories, and a full history of notes and minutes from our regular meetings. So what is the story behind DINA? The community of institutions holding natural history collections is quite diverse. It comprises different stakeholders like curators, collection staff, and researchers from different scientific domains, people who design and maintain the necessary infrastructure like informaticians, software developers, data creators, database and system administrators. Furthermore, the institutions mostly work in close collaboration with engaged students, visitors and citizen scientists, as well as public organization and governmental agencies. So serving all of these different stakeholders and domains can really be a balancing act from the perspective of data management and the underlying infrastructure. As the stakeholders have to cope with different types of information, slightly different agendas, workflows and available resources, you can observe within the realm of data management that this often leads to individual solutions and separated software products that could never be accommodated in one monolithic collection management system. At the core, this is probably also why so many different collection management systems and tools have evolved over the last decades. Let's just think of a monolithic collection management system that has the expected core functionality like accommodating information on specimens, their determinations, storage, preparations, collecting events, etc. But there is also the need to accommodate research data with metadata on publications, funded projects, people, and lots of other information like permits and related documentation. And with more research activities, there comes even more individually structured data and metadata that would simply overload a single system. So at this point, then you really know there is no one size fits all solution. But instead, there are several separate collection management systems that implement new features according to their individual needs, priorities and resources. Such new features are often similar by definition, for example, the capabilities to, to document metadata on access and benefit sharing. But such features are implemented in several systems in parallel and organically evolve over time according to the kind of implementation and maintenance. But at the end of the day, we could still call this redundant development effort as it serves all the very same purpose. The approach of DINA is to address these challenges and the different requirements in the diverse landscape by trying to minimize the redundancy in software development by joint development efforts and to maximize the reuse and interoperability of tools for collection management in a way that new features can be deployed to local infrastructures from a common code base. There already is a huge community of national and international projects initiatives and organizations like Tedwig, Synthesis, Disco, IDIC Bio and others that cope with essential aspects related to collection data management, like for example data standards and digitization. And each DINA member institution is actively involved in several of these initiatives and conduct necessary knowledge transfer. So there's lots of expertise in the community with a high potential to bring the development and optimization of collection management systems to the next level. In terms of potential membership, the DINA community should actually look like this. And as a logical next step from an implementation perspective, DINA envisions the development of collection management systems as both intellectually and practically distributed effort within the natural history domain. In order to organize this joint effort, DINA provides a scalable model for breaking down the envisioned architecture in digestible chunks for development. 
which starts from content-driven high-level information packages to mid-level functional components and down to concrete module descriptions. The information packages serve as basic definitions of data classes, like for example, collection information, geographical information, taxonomy, agents, and files in need. These high-level concepts are defined in order to represent a common understanding between all stakeholders and to set the scene for the next level. The level of functional components describes the desired functionality for different use cases and workflows from a user perspective and includes, for example, user interfaces and high-level data relations. The lower level of module descriptions specify the concrete bits of the data model and requirements for implementation as a result from the user stories. This can then be used to create the backlog for development tasks that can be distributed to the developer teams. This approach would result in a clear idea of the modules with distinct purposes and how they interact with each other and depend on each other. In order to assemble these modules to a system, they need to be interoperable. This can be achieved by exposing web-based APIs that strictly follow common guidelines. These guidelines are documented and maintained by the DINA consortium as well. So if the modeling approach and the API guidelines are being met by developers, collection management systems and related tools will be capable of using only the modules needed. Alternative components with identical use cases but different richness and complexity can be used as swappable modules in the DINA environment as well. So how could you contribute to the DINA activities? First of all, as a Tetric community, you can join our modeling efforts. So feel free to contact us or visit our website and Git repository for more information. When it comes to the coding, there are three ways to contribute to DINA. First, if you develop a piece of software from scratch, you just need to follow the DINA guidelines in order to make your code DINA compliant. Secondly, if you already maintain and further develop a piece of code, you can refactor it towards DINA compliance. And if it's not feasible to change an existing code base, you can still wrap it with an API layer in order to make it DINA compliant. With these methods, DINA is envisaged as a more sustainable, community-driven ecosystem that can evolve and adapt to new challenges, technologies, and requirements. So please reveal your source code and feel invited to contribute to our development activities. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Um, are there any questions related to Dina? I don't see some in the Google document, and I assume that there are also no questions in the chat. So I would actually take on the question uh, raised by, by Doug um, before. So how do Dina and Specify collaborate. The, the background actually is that um, the Specify team was part of the Dina collaboration some years ago, and um, the collaboration got a little bit loose over the time for several reasons. Um, but actually, the Dina members uh, are using Specify in most cases. Um, and um, they have used Specify and still use it. So um, we are actually, from the perspective of systems, very close. Um, and we are still talking. And um, maybe just as an example for uh, the third way of code contribution to DINA, um, we actually created in the DINA consortium a module for printing labels um, quite easily web-based. And so um, 
as, for example, um, the Natural History Museum in Berlin also uses specify for the uh, collection, for the management of collection objects. We just um, connected the, the DINA labels module with a kind of wrapper API, so the third way to contribute the code, you know, um, to use the specify seven API. And so actually the systems are working together on that level. And there is a high potential to increase this um, uh, compliance. Actually. So there is another question uh, by Ian Engelbrecht. Um, are there some nice examples of modules completed and ready for use? So yes, as, as I mentioned um, uh, before, there is, for example, the labels module. But um, as you have seen in the presentation, um, we also use existing software. And so uh, the team in Canada, the Agri uh, Culture, Agri Food uh, Institute in Ottawa, um, actually um, makes the sequence database SecDB um, a part of DINA. It always was a part of DINA and just refactors this piece of software uh, to make it DINA compliant. So yes, for example, this component is also uh, already usable and it's on its way to um, um, increase the compliance with the um, uh, um, DINA guidelines. And actually it's all about uh, microservices that uh, should be or could be compliant. So um, we are always talking about this idea of having um, an environment for collection management. Um, and so the, the bits and pieces that we uh, develop and have developed in the past, um, they are in most cases, um, like the labels module, for example, um, usable as a standalone. So I can use also the, the labels module uh, without any collection data. For example, at the MFN, we uh, also uh, print labels for our library, which is not accommodated in Specify, for example. Um, and so this is a, actually a, an environment of microservices that are interoperable and usable. Okay, then maybe I um, give myself one more minute for one more question uh, raised by Miko Heikinen. Has comparable uh, uh, ways of creating software ecosystems uh, used in other fields, for example, libraries, other success stories. So from the DINA perspective, um, I can say at least um, in Berlin, we are taking this DINA uh, um, approach even beyond our collection management. So my answer would be uh, yes, we are also creating um, microservices for other purposes that could be and are actually connected to, um, to the um, DINA environment and compliant to the DINA compliant uh, uh, DINA environment, although these components um, might not be uh, um, at the very core of a collection management system. And this is especially true when it comes to research data. So we have a very generic module for accommodating research data and arbitrary uh, data models that could be plugged to collection uh, data if the collection objects have been used for this research. But this component also can be used for any other kind of information and metadata, for example, in the administration. And that's what we do. Um, and so, yes, outside the domain, even though, even though there are just a few examples, um, there are uh, um, some of them where we reuse microservices um, that are DINA compliant. And I'm happy to answer some more questions, um, but being aware of the time, 
I would like to hand over to Matt Yoda um, and he will be our last but not least um, presenter for today and he will present um, meeting in between moving beyond the bus bottlenecks and bubble to collaboratively develop digitization tooling. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, so I'm Matt Yoder. I am a biological informatician at the Illinois Natural History Survey. I'm just going to move my window over here so I'm not looking at the camera. Um, and I want to start my talk by sort of reflecting on what Vince did said. He, he talked a lot about the bigger picture, and I want to make the picture even bigger um, and think about really what we're doing um, and sort of set the framework from what we're doing from a, from a big, big picture perspective. But before I do that, I should mention that uh, in a lot of interactive presentations, you can see um, people chiming in on chat. So in remote presentations, now we have the opportunity to talk while other people talk while the presenter is presenting. So I've added little things that you can interact with. So for example, if you answer this question, you can say H in chat if you agree. So look for these little cues on the slides there. So back to this, what do I mean here? Um, I think when we talk about natural history collections, we're talking about going out and killing things and bringing them back uh, and, and then studying them and doing science with them. And we're not just going out and killing things and bringing them back for, to make trophy rooms, right? We're doing science. And so um, we can talk a lot about these types of things, inter interoperability, standards, API, and provenance. And I think that there's probably a lot of first timers here at this meeting who are coming in as scientists and they're trying, trying to see what are these standards all about? And scientists are trying to work on specific hypotheses. They're trying to do specific things. Um, and so I don't want to um, sort of gatekeep as to what we should be doing on this side. Of course, the best science is the science that deals with all of these issues and, and deals with it in the context of these hypotheses. So I think that when we're thinking about a lot of these complex things, what I want to say is that is that we can sort of feel free to say, well, you know what, maybe we shouldn't look at this standard or maybe this interoperability or this province isn't so important because I can't see a direct connection to these this hypothesis. So a reminder that we've got lots of things going on, but at the end of the day, we're talking about science and science is about talking hypothesis. So the more specifically we can reference hypothesis, the better off we might be. So I'm going to start really big uh, with some philosophy there at the beginning. Um, I'm going to stay big for a spooky story. It's getting to be Halloween. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by a bubble, the biodiversity informatics bubble. And then I'll get increasingly specific and more practical and uh, less esoteric. So what do I mean by a bubble? Um, a long time ago, we can imagine that somebody was out in the field, a person, and they were out there and they collected some natural history sp specimen. And everything that person was doing is sort of in their brain, in their space. And so we might call that the meat space bubble. That person then brought that specimen back perhaps and then started recording observations, little bits of data and writing them down in the book. And so at that moment where they started uh, recording data, they created this biodiversity informatics bubble, I'd like to think of it as. And that bubble grew very quickly, right? It grew with as meat space grew, as there was more um, collectors, and it grew as there was more metadata and more specimens, more classes of observations and that kind of thing. Then when computers hit, um, the, the, the bubble got giant, right? It grew very, very rapidly, we can think of it. Further on then, the World Wide Web hit and the bubble just got ginormous, right? We have standards now, we have many different kinds of IDs. We have um, competing ID structures. We have many, many different concepts, all dealing with computers. We're not even mentioning all of the different kinds of languages that are available, all the different kinds of software that we might work with. And what happens is that this started to put a lot, this bubble starts to put a lot of pressure on our little meat space, our little humans there. We have to deal with all this, think about all this as we're implementing things. Uh, and what I get the sense is happening when I come to sort of meetings like Tadwig is that the bubble starts to have its own life. It starts to feed on itself, right? So in this sense of the bubble, it's a, it's a sort of, a, it's its own entity. It's alive, right? Rod, 
observe that the graph is, assemble, is assembling itself and there's statements being made like, we need to take care of the digital specimen. We need to figure out everybody else's data. We, we, we talk about deliverables, deliverables and outcomes, not hypotheses in science. Um, we're not, oh, it's not okay if we're just digitized, right? So these kind of statements to somebody who's uh, on the ground floor doing the hard work are, are, are disheartening, right? Like, I don't know if I'll ever be done. And it's disheartening from the meat paste perspective. It's like this sort of digital entity has consumed us all. So I want to sort of encourage us to sort of remember that we want to keep and stay practical, right? Go and maybe one of the ways that we can collaborate in our development is to go back to the source, go back to the meat space. So for example, I was at the IPT uh, digitization group. This is, should be one of the most advanced digitization efforts in the US today. And there's some absolutely incredible workflows that have been worked out for there. But those workflows are also doing things that computers do very well, like renaming my image files. If you're doing this in your workflow, this is not okay, right? There's many, many things that we could be doing to serve curators and serve those basic scientists that um, you know, have nothing to do with this monster, right? That have these needs have not yet been met. And so I'd really like to encourage us to think about going back to the source and really deriving what we do, um, deriving what we do together by referencing that source. So some actual practical examples. One of the things we built out and one of the things you could do is build um, sort of user interface widgets or user interaction widgets um, completely agnostically. So this is a widget that we bought, we built. All it does is produce a grid and it lets you put some labels on top of the grid. It has nothing to do with our particular software, TaxonWorks. It has nothing to do with any particular software. It's just a UI that makes it a really slick little grid that you can overlay things. So anybody can take this JavaScript widget. So what did we do with it? We use this widget to, to become part of the core user interface experience in our slide digitizer. You get to quickly add cells, quickly drag and drop them, overlay identifiers so that you can see that you're digitizing things, et cetera. So COVID hit, we had a huge backlog of slides um, at the Illinois History Survey. They were all uploaded, drag dropped on there, no file renaming. Uh, this widget allowed us to process 45,000 slides since COVID happened, right? And so I want to encourage us to think about how can we take the essence of what's critical here in these user interfaces and share that as separate software components. Uh, so so wh where should we go and look for sort of the new components? What kind of new components we, should we go and build? A lot of our users have, um, and a lot of, sorry, a lot of the software systems are using open um, development approaches, right? So they're actually doing all their development on GitHub. A lot of these open issues here are coming from curators and other research scientists who have gone through the technical hurdles of you know, learning GitHub and figuring out what an issue tracker is and that kind of thing. So they're willing to engage the development process and they've said, here's what I need most, right? Here's what I need most, here's what I need most. So these issues overlap almost certainly. So we might actually encourage a bit bigger of a biodiversity informatics bubble by summarizing these in technologies like Trello, which could add you know, cross-reference issues across these trackers. And this may be a way to figure out what kind of things we should build um, better with. So another idea that falls on the first idea is that um, we, we need to really embrace this idea of macro. So the question for you, chat, is how many fields did the user input to produce this knowledge graph, right? And so you can say, is it one for one, two for two to 10, three for 11 to 50 or four for 50 plus, guess. So this is groundbreaking work, I would argue that's fair. This is Lars Vogt et al. But this red idea is this small, this idea of expanding user inputs into knowledge graphs. So this was literally four to six fields typed in to represent this COVID data um, in, a, in a semantic web framework we cannot persist this data in, in databases. It just doesn't scale, right? So we have to produce it on demand. So this idea of small binaries that are purposely built to expand our assertions. So maybe I go from the word um, Texas to a shape, right? And these can be very shared across many, many different tools. Um, so another idea about sharing code. And I really wanna plug existing projects. Um, Ed's work, Arctos work, uh, Specify work. These are groundbreaking 
projects with huge communities and they're doing a lot of great work. And so I think one of the last things we should really consider, and I really like to emphasize is that we could join an existing project. Um, and, and there's just lots of cool features that are coming out there um, in, in general. So I'll just leave it at that. And yesterday we talked about, there was a digital specimen um, symposia or meeting. And in that, uh, I think we're at the point with a lot of these software packages, Arctos, Specify, TaxonWorks, um, where we can very closely work with uh, standards development and sort of next generation tools. So this is the one millionth specimen uh, at the, that was curated, that was accessioned into the INHS Insight Collection. It happens to be a louse. Um, it actually happens to have some biological relationships, et cetera. I, I, I took our existing interfaces, which all serve JSON, right? For all of these different concepts, I think TaxonWorks, we have some 50 different data concepts. I modified them to, into a new API that serves JSON that produces um, you know, a digital specimen concept, right? And so this is just a crude summary of that. All of these different colors are different relationship types to different concepts. Um, and these are all already creatable and editable in the user interface through some really cool widgets, annotating widgets um, immediately at your fingertips for, for adding and editing and curating your data in the system. So I think not only TaxonWorks, but a lot of software packages are well poised to work a lot closer with standards development. And I think that's really critical um, to have that grounding in standards development. So one last thing we can do, I think I mentioned communities before and communities are absolutely key. And um, so what we've done with the species file group, for those of you who are not familiar with that, we, we, do, we do manage tools like software, um, sorry, like TaxonWorks, but Global Names is, is under the umbrella of the species file group and funded by the species file group. We do a lot of work with a catalog of life as well. And we're super duper proud um, and excited to welcome Debbie Paul um, as our new community liaison. And, Debbie is being tasked with, of course, working with some of the things we're doing specifically, but she's also tasked with time to help facilitate community development. So everybody's software packages uh, on a broad scale. So please welcome uh, Debbie and um, Debbie, we're super excited to have you here. And I look forward to uh, working with you and sort of tackling the problems that this symposia is facing. So I'll just wrap up. Um, I'd like to just make two plugs. Um, First, uh, we've been having weekly digitization uh, webinars and we'll continue to do those. These are mostly with our existing users, but with this talk, I've officially welcome anybody in. Um, we can contact me or Deb and we'll put you on the email list and we'll open that up to the broader community if we don't get completely slammed after this talk. Um, so, so do feel free to join and ask any kind of questions that you want there. And we are gonna have a, a TaxonWorks hack event over sort of the course of the week, sometime this fall, there's been a lot of requests for that kind of thing. So if you want to stay on top of what we're doing, specifically with TaxonWorks, we do a lot of announcements um, on Twitter. So thanks, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, there was just one question that arrived in, in the uh, Google document um, asked by uh, Jared Hoylen. Um, Given that code equals data, what is your vision in making next steps in code slash data legal works? Yeah, thanks, Jort, for, for asking the tough question. Um, I think, you know, so we talked about, it's a tough question, a good question to think about combining it all together. Um, can we zip, you know, could we zip a snapshot of your project's data in TaxonWorks plus the whole code base and perhaps identify it, you know, as a snapshot, as an archival reference that this is what it looked like at this time. Um, certainly we could package things up like that. I think that there are very specific small modules that could be purpose built for biological purposes. So, you know, like we have the, the slide digitization widget, and we have a number of other annotation widgets, et cetera, that we produce in that same framework, but maybe the widgets that have just a little bit of biology could be packaged up with the code that's produced. So maybe you can then plug that into a Jupyter notebook or um, your publication, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of technology now that lets you embed that, that R code or that Python code, code or JavaScript code or Ruby code. Um, that's used in something like TaxonWorks, into your Jupyter Notebook, into your PenSelf publication, those kind of things. So uh, I think there's a lot of power and potential there. 
Thanks. Um, and I just see that uh, Dimitri Schiegel is uh, writing in the, in the document. I'm typing. So maybe you would like to speak up instead of typing and raise a question. Uh, Matthias, I can jump ahead and ask your answer your third question. Yes, we've started to record them. Um, they've been very informal, like we often share each other's um, desktops and those kind of things. So we have to be a little bit careful and we're increasingly trying to, to be cognizant, like, you know, saying we're now recording, we're now not recording. Um, and they're, they're friendly and informal. So um, there we have probably hundreds of hours. We, we also do a nomenclature based webinar every Wednesday. For those of you who are interested in on the nomenclature side, we'll be opening that up as well. We're gonna see how this digitization opening up. But if you're interested in more of the technical nomenclature side of things, there's another one that we do every Wednesday as well. Um, some of that, yeah. So some of that YouTube channel is is new there. And there's some help things that have been put up by Tommy McElrath, our, our curator. And, and we do have a lot of video recorded. I'm not sure if we're gonna share it for sure, but. It, it, it is available and we have shared it in different ways to, uh, to, to folks. And increasingly we need to do that to better get our message out to the community. Well, this sounds really good. Um, are there more questions for Matt? Okay, that seems not to Thanks. be the case. Thank you, Matt. Um, may I ask you to unshare your screen? Yep. Uh, let's see. So, and we are perfectly in time. Um, so I would really like to uh, wrap uh, things up here. And um, I would like to go ahead and share my screen again. I think we've we've seen really lots of nice presentations, and um, I think also uh, seeing in the chat and from the from the questions, the uh, the short discussions that we have, that uh, there's uh, um, we all agree that uh, we should work closely together, be it uh, content-wise or um, in terms of development, and so. Um, I just briefly put together this slide here um, as a kind of summary and um, or it's not a summary, but it, there is one thing that I just got reminded. There is actually from the Biodiversity Next conference, uh, the interest group, the Tetric interest group uh, for developers. And it's been very quiet over the year. It's a fresh group. And so I, I think um, we don't have to worry about that. But um, what's about putting all our uh, new desired features that we envision um, in, in our collection management systems and research tools um, to the Tadwick um, uh, GitHub repo for developers be it from a user perspective or from a developer perspective, in order just to shout into this uh, virtual space um, what we are currently working on or what's the desired features so that we can at least avoid uh, future redundant work and uh, actually achieve this kind of even closer collaboration. There is a great collaboration on, on the standards here. When it comes to coding, uh, we, we actually there is an, a high potential, especially for uh, optimizing our uh, collection management uh, systems. So um, from the Google document, um, you nicely also entered uh, your names and email addresses. So um, I would really, really like to see a, a follow up on, on these discussions. Um, in the virtual space, be it in our um, uh, Google document that we will leave open at least for a week, um, be it uh, in the Tadwick GitHub repo or even uh, um, other opportunities um, uh, to collaborate. And um, at this point, I would really like to thank all of the presenters 
um, my co-moderators and helpers and uh, the whole TEDRIC organiza uh, um, organizers to make this conference possible. Um, and I would also like to thank all of the participants um, for your interest, questions and discussions. And these will be continued. Um, please feel free to sign up um, in our Google uh, document if you haven't done that yet. Um, and uh, we will make sure that you keep informed uh, on any follow-up activities and that you also get your questions that we could not uh, um, answer yet, um, that you get them answered afterwards. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to uh, the next sessions today at 8 p.m. UTC, uh, which is, uh, for example, the Symposium 8, Introduction to the New Living Atlases Community, and the session on um, contributed presentations um, at 10 p.m. UTC. And there is also a, a panel discussion on Friday uh, with a, I think, strong relation to our uh, symposium and discussion today. It is the panel discussion PD03, Enabling Digital Specimens and Extended Specimens Concepts in current tools and services. It's on Friday, 2 p.m. UTC. And of course, there are lots of many other great up, uh, upcoming sessions in this uh, conference. So thank you very much again and enjoy the next sessions at the, at the TEDVIC conference. See you soon. <laughs>